thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mathieu van der from uh, I'm from Rotterdam, Netherlands, and I want to talk to you uh, about cerebral uh, perfusion pressure. Is the microphone on? Ah, that helps. So, uh, Mathieu van der uh, good morning. I want to talk to you about uh, cerebral perfusion pressure in, uh, uh, in general management of severe TBI. So, I have no uh, declaration of interest. Uh, except that I was involved in some TBI study. Um, so, when we talk about CPP, we have to first say what is CPP. Um, so, definition is mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure, and it's actually the driving pressure of blood into the brain arteries minus the resistance, which is uh, estimated to be equal to ICP. We can also not talk about CPP without discussing, very briefly, autoregulation. As you know, this is just simple basic physiology that uh, C cerebral blood flow is kept constant over a range of uh, uh, blood pressures or CPPs and when uh, blood pressure or CPP goes down then the arteries in the brain dilate to decrease the cerebral vascular resistance and to uh, maintain stable uh, cerebral blood flow. So this is simple physiology and uh, when blood pressure is too low uh, ischemia results and when it's too high you get hyperemia and cerebral edema or maybe even uh, um, intracerebral hemorrhage. But in uh, brain trauma or, or traumatic brain injury, the uh, situation uh, is different um, because the uh, autoregulation is narrowed and um, the compensatory mechanisms of the brain uh, are uh, exhausted. We know from uh, observational study this to be true, so this is a study by, uh, by Guisa, the, they have looked at insults of uh, low CPP uh, and summarized it and associated it with outcome and you see blue is a good outcome and red is a bad outcome. So when you have a lot of insults uh, below 60 millimeters of mercury in the CPP or a lot of insults that have a long duration, so this is duration on the y-axis, uh, then you can summarize this as a optimal CPP on a population level and that's somewhere between 60 and 90. And as you see the Brain Trauma, Trauma Foundation guidelines, they advise a CPP of 60 to 70, which is on the lower border of this population-based optimum. So that's interesting. And they actually um, uh, advise to avoid aggressively having maintained a CPP above 70. But when you look at this, as, at this optimum, that might not be ideal for every patient. So in Centre TBI, that's a big uh, European observational study, um, uh, multi-centre and more than 60 centres in, uh, in Europe. We looked at the targets that were adhered to in, uh, in, uh, in all these centres, and most centres said they would maintain CP above 60, like 60%, and above 70, only 20%, above 50, 11%, and individualised treatments, 38%. So there's a lot of variability there. So recently there have been a lot of publication on consensus which CPP should be the target. And to summarize all these guidelines, uh, you might say that the target of CPP when you uh, do not monitor uh, the brain uh, otherwise than ICP is the CPP generally above 60, but it should be kept below 70 to 90. And it may depend on a MAP challenge, which I will explain a little bit later, uh, when you don't monitor, for instance, for cerebral oximetry or for autoregulation. Or when you do multimodality monitoring, you could say that you should target individualized the CPP between 50 and 90. So first we have to say what, what is the philosophy behind the CPP. Um, and this is a, a very nice trial, the BOOST trial, that looked at the additional value of uh, PBRO2 next to ICP monitoring. Uh, and this is a trial in, in 60, uh, in, I think over 100 patients, sorry, uh, and it investigated uh, this. And what's interesting or what is important to note is that when you manage ICP, there's no special intervention for CPP in the treatment algorithm in this trial. But when you try to optimize uh, cerebral oxygen, then uh, CPP optimization increase above 70 is, can be an important part of the management. So when you manage ICP, you should avoid high pressure. This is the well-known pressure volume curve and the Monroe Kelly doctrine. But when you optimize uh, cerebral oxygenation and metabolism, that's actually the goal of CPP. So they're complementary. Um, 
and but they they um, they aim for different goals in the treatment. And in this trial, indeed, the PBRO2 monitored uh, patient had more uh, CPP interventions, uh, and as a result, there was uh, more there was a, a higher oxygenation in these patients, and it translated into a better outcome. But this was not it was this trial was not powered for that outcome. So it's not the discussion about what is more important, ICP or CPP, um, but CPP just serves a different goal to optimize CBF and optimal brain oxygenation in stress circumstances. And ICP is more a mechanical construct uh, indicating intracranial compliance reserve. So um, uh, these are different things that should be managed both. So then to CPP optimization, how should we manage that with fluids or vasopressors? Also in the center TBI studies, we, uh, we looked at what centers did uh, as a routine, and actually almost all, all centers said that they tried to uh, increase CPP when necessary with both fluids and vasoactive drugs. Interestingly, a lot of centers also indicated that they used inotropes for CPP increase, um, and I'm not sure if, that's, uh, if there's much evidence for that. So this is uh, the Robertson trial from 99. This is actually an important trial because it, uh, it was the basis to change the CPP target of more than 70 in um, the pre-last uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, uh, and it changed to uh, um, an AIM CPP of 60 to 70, and it was, it was based on this study. What did they do? There was a CBBF targeted group and an ICP targeted group. It was a um, a randomized study in 180 patients, and in the CBF targeted group, there was an aim for a higher CPP of over 70, uh, and in the ICP, ICP targeted group, there was an aim for CPP above 50, um, uh, and it could be uh, established with volume or vasopressors. And indeed, in the CBF group, they had a higher CPP, so that they managed to do that. But there were less ischemic insults measured with jugular bulb desaturations in this, uh, in this study, but there were much more fluids given and more positive fluid balance and significantly higher central venous pressure, although the numbers were not given in the study. And in the study, there were five, more, five times more often ARDS, so there was 15% of ARDS in the CBF group and uh, only 3% uh, in the ICP uh, group, but there were no differences in ICP and no differences in outcome in the end in this study. So also based on this study, we did a large multicenter uh, analysis within the center TBI study uh, showing that when um, you have a mean daily fluid balance of over uh, neutral, so more than uh, zero, that it was incrementally associated with worse outcome as measured with the Glasgow outcome skill, uh, skill extended. So when this line is going up with a higher fluid balance, it means that outcomes is worse after six months. This was a pros uh, prospective study, and it was highly uh, significant. Also, on a center level, with instrumental variable analysis, which is an analysis which tries to avoid confounding by indication, so this is more, more a center effect, which is more a, a random variation than a patient-driven variation. We uh, confirmed the signal. So you could say, uh, so this is uh, zero fluid balance. You could say that the centers that, in general, gave more fluids and had a more positive fluid balance, uh, they, those patients had worse outcomes. And when we look at the sub-analysis, uh, you can see that more fluid intake is associated with a lower CPP, which is imaginable because when CPP goes down, some people tend to give fluids next to vasopressors, so this is a logical sign. You also see this here in a norepinephrine dosage. But when we uh, adjusted the analysis for CPP, um, there was actually no impact on the association between fluid balance and outcome. So, uh, this is probably not a relevant confounder, and um, it is more likely that it might be on the causal pathway that giving more fluids might lead to a worse outcome. Um, in the Robertson trial, the beneficial effect of CPP-targeted policy might have been offset, therefore, I think, by the adverse effect of fluid overloading. So in, if we would have been more mindful with fluid overloading, maybe, maybe the policy of the improved CPP would have had a better impact on outcome. 
So what's the solution to limit fluid overload to, to aim for a better CPP? Let's target net neutral fluid balances. Of course, this should be titrated every, in every day in every individual patient, but you should strive mean for, for a neutral fluid balance probably, and maybe we should apply more often hemodynamic monitoring, but actually uh, there are no studies on that, and that's something that should be studies, I think. So which vasopressors or fluids should we then give when we try to optimize uh, CPP? So we can be brief about the uh, vasopressors. Norepinephrine is, I think, a good choice, but in meta-analysis or in observational studies, there is not really a difference with, for instance, ph uh, phenylephrine, but there are no randomized clinical trials. And regarding the type of fluids, this is a sub-analysis of the basics trial, and you can see that uh, in traumatic brain injuries specifically, uh, normal saline, 0.9%, seems to be superior uh, as opposed to balanced solutions. So probably 0.9% uh, saline is a good choice to give to patients when you uh, want to give them fluids. So what about the MAP challenge that I earlier mentioned? So this is the CIBIC consensus, which is a consensus um, uh, flow chart for clinical use, which is actually a more practical translation of the BTF uh, guidelines. Uh, I will not go into detail, but it's important to notice that when you want to optimize CPP, you can perform a MAP challenge before going to the Tire 3 rescue therapies. So what's the MAP challenge? That is uh, um, a temporary increase of the MAP to increase the CPP for uh, 10 millimeters of mercury for 20 minutes. And then when the ICP goes up, that would be an indication that the uh, outregulation is disturbed. And when, uh, when it does not go up, you can uh, maintain the higher MAP uh, because outregulation is intact. This is not a validated method, but it's, it's a reasonably uh, proposed method to apply in, cl in clinical practice. So then what about outregulation monitoring? Um, a recent consensus actually had no consensus on the benefits of, uh, of outregulation monitoring, which is also cause, uh, called the, um, um, the pressure reactivity index, but the jury is still out, and that is why uh, a randomized trial has recently been done, we'll, I will discuss briefly. So what is the pressure reactivity index? As you see on the left side, the association between MAP and ICP uh, actually translates into the autoregulation. So when there's not a high association between ICP and MAP, you can draw a correlation, which is negative in this, in this instance because they don't follow each other. But when they follow each other, so when ICP goes up, when MAP goes up, and vice versa, then there's a strong correlation uh, up to a correlation coefficient of 1. So the lower your PRX is, the better your autoregulation because the MAP and ICP, they respond independently. And it seems that for most patients, you can um, uh, determine a CPP optimal, which is the lowest, lowest autoregulation index, depending on a variable CPP. So it's interesting. It's something you might be able to optimize by varying your CPP with norepinephrine, for instance. And in a landmark study by Marshall Arias and the Cambridge group, they found that indeed when the CPP optimal was more often obtained in patients, uh, patients that had more often the CPP optimal had a better outcome. So this is why they did a, a feasibility randomized clinical trial recently published in the Journal of Neurotrauma. It was a feasibility and safety study, not powered for uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, feasibility was to, uh, to uh, uh, obtain the CPP target in more than a third of the patients, uh, and safety was about rescue therapies because they were afraid that when optimizing CPP with the other regulation that other measures like decompressions would be more frequent and that might also have side effects. So in short, one group uh, was randomized to the BDF guidelines, CPP target of 60 to 70, and another one was uh, um, uh, randomized to the CPP optimized, which was provided by ICM Plus software, who calculated the optimized CPP every four hours uh, and uh, gave this uh, result to the clinicians, and they could uh, adapt CPP. And indeed, the trial was positive in the sense that uh, the uh, optimal CPP target was um, obtained in uh, almost half of the patients in the intervention group, which, was, which was, was much more often than in the control group because they measured there also, but they didn't act on it. 
Uh, and indeed, CPP in the intervention group was a little bit higher, and this was uh, significant. And regarding safety, there were no issues, and the, um, the outcome was better, but this was not powered on outcome. Um, but this is interesting, and it shows the feasibility of this uh, method. So CPP, take home messages. CPP is a, is a means to an end rather than a goal in itself. Uh, it will improve CBF, um, and that's actually the goal, to improve uh, PBRO2 and brain metabolism. I think we should leave the discussion what is more important, ICP versus CPP. They're both important, but from different angles. And it might be pursued, the optimized CPP, without multimodality monitoring, possibly if you, if you use the MAP challenge, which is, I think, not widely implemented yet. CPP can be fairly uh, easily influenced. You can just give vasopressors, but you should, I think, mind fluid overload, which can be detrimental. Um, and can happen very easily, as we have shown in the European study. Um, and CPP is probably um, uh, amenable to individualized targets for it with monitoring, but studies proving outcome benefits are still lacking, but they are on the way. Thank you for your attention. So we would like to thank you for this excellent lecture. And... Uh, I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience. Please. Professor Takona. Thanks for the lecture. Um, I have a practical question that is always coming in the clinical practice. Where do you zero in the pressure levels to measure the CPP, so blood pressure and CPP. And the second one is that uh, one important message, I think, I don't know if you agree, is that many people feel that more than 60 CPP values is a safe, and they do not care about CPP anymore, while it's probably we are quite far to be sure that this is a good level. And uh, the big issues is that if you lack of uh, advanced monitoring, how you, do, how you can do the bedside. If you lack of autoregulation in PBTO2, can you still use something to try to understand whether this level of CPP can be further modified? Yeah, so your second question, the answer, the best answer I now have is the MAP challenge, but actually I don't do it yet in clinical practice. Maybe I should consider doing it, but actually when I was making this talk, I, I I realized that not having PBR2 measures or not having autoregulation and still trying to optimize your CPP is actually impossible. So uh, the answer is that you should probably do more monitoring, that is when you want to optimize CPP, when you think it's important. So your first question is a very, very good question. You should level at the tragus, so at the ear. So your blood pressure should be at the ear at the same level as where you uh, your balance your ICP uh, um, uh, monitoring. So um, that's actually how it was originally done. But in studies, um, studying CPP, there's a lot of variability, which has also been shown in several studies. So, um, um, and to be honest, uh, sometimes our patients are not that upright, and sometimes they are not leveled when we look at the CPP. So uh, I have to, I have to, I'm guilty, too, to, for not being very uh, keen on, on that issue. But actually, you should level at the, at the ear level. Uh, I would also like to, make, to uh, ask a question. So, uh, how about vasopressors? Which one would you uh, recommend? You said before that, uh, well, we do not have uh, data of superiority between uh, norepinephrine and phenylephrine. But uh, I understand that uh, other vasopressors, for example, vasopressin, have not been tested that uh, extensively. And uh, there are theoretical reasons. For example, uh, there may be an alpha effect of uh, norepinephrine in the uh, vessels of the brain. And uh, on the contrary, vasopressin may not have such an effect, and this may be an advantage, or a disadvantage, at least a difference. Yes, the excellent question. I think... Um uh, we don't know what's best, that's, that's the honest answer, but we, we use norepinephrine. There has actually been uh, performed a small pilot randomized trial on vasopressin, which was negative, of course, because it was not powered. 
Um, but it is feasible to give vasopressin, but as, of course there's a concern that because of your vasopressin, your uh, diuresis will go down and your sodium, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it can influence your sodium homeostasis, mm -hmm. which is, of course, uh, somewhat of a risk in, uh, in TBI. So I think that's the reason why vasopressin is kind of a, a drug for, for CPP management that people are a little bit afraid to use it. So. Um, um, I think more trials are needed. But that's a theoretical risk of vasopressin that your uh, sodium goes down, which is, of course, not something you want in TBI. Thank you very much. So we would like to thank you. Thank you. And